So many dangers are unforeseen. The fear of confronting them can become overwhelming. I'm William Shatner. Tonight, true stories of heroes and victims who, despite all odds, never give up on Rescue 911. We begin in the dead of winter in Jackson, Wyoming, where a series of storms in early 1988 had created hazardous conditions in the Grand Teton Mountains. Teton Pass connects Idaho and Wyoming. It can be a dangerous road in the wintertime with the avalanche conditions. The most dangerous stretch of the road runs under Glory Bow, an area particularly prone to avalanches. On January 11, 1988, a violent winter storm was blanketing the area with heavy snow. The Wyoming Highway Department dispatched snowplow driver Don Fisher to clear the roads. Supervisor Jack Oakley was also on duty that morning. Don's been up there a long time and had a lot of experience dealing with the slides and he's plowed Teton Pass maybe 13 to 15 years. The threat of an avalanche increases dramatically with high winds and heavy snowfall. So Jack decided to close down Teton Pass. Before Don left the mountain, he radioed that he was going to check on a stranded motorist he had spotted earlier. Down. We got a stranded car on the west side. Check it out. Rotary plow driver Ernie Potter was dispatched to help close the road. I just felt that there was a real good chance that we was going to have slides that day up there. Of the threat of an avalanche, Don stopped as he approached Glory Bowl to make sure it was safe to drive past it. When we continue. I was scared of what I'd find, but I had to go look. I had to go down and see if he was still alive. Don? Jackson Shaw. Well, something was the matter. We knew that. That's negative. I haven't been able to contact Fish at all. As the minutes passed and they still heard nothing from Don, his co-workers became increasingly worried. Give you a call. It would have been half hour, hour. So I volunteered to go up and see if anything was the matter. Radio technician Chuck Kakalich and driver Russ Moses headed up the mountain. I've known Don for 20 plus years now. He's a great guy. He's kind of the father of the bunch around here. He's just a good leader and a good friend. I kind of knew in my mind what the problem was, I thought, and uh, it's scary. You know, I just kind of had a, a sick feeling in my stomach and just hoping for the best. We got just about to Glory Bowl and run into a slide that we couldn't get through with the pickup. Chuck, he said he was going to run on up and take a look. Russ radioed back to the dispatcher that they needed some assistance to clear the road. So I walked up on the road and saw that Glory Bowl had slid. Looked at it walked up on it and looked 
the downhill side of it. That's when I saw the front bumper and the, the lug nuts from the truck. I was scared of what I'd find, but I had to go look. So I moved down and dug down far enough to find the door frame and get oriented to where I could start digging down through the passenger side window. The snow was packed in tight. Don! His right hand Don. popped up. It came up and he just shook it. I knew he was still alive then. You're gonna be all right, buddy. We're gonna get you out of there. It made me want to work faster. Get down, get his head uncovered. I was afraid that hypothermia would beat me. When Ernie arrived in the rotary plow, he was still unaware that his friend and fellow driver, Don, was buried in the avalanche. When I pulled up, I could see the glory bowl had round. And I was looking around, I looked over to my left. Bring some help! So I called Jack on the radio and I says, Chuck says he's found him and he's alive, get help. Emergency response teams of volunteers from all over Teton County were immediately dispatched to the scene. Hang on, we got help coming. Chuck had Don's face uncovered when I got there. You'll be okay, buddy. He was conscious. He's pretty much out of it. He didn't say much. His color was gray. His eyes were glassy. Hold on. He hollered at me and wanted to know if I had a short shovel. That particular day, all I had was a, a about a three-pound coffee can. I think he just had a little room that he could breathe. His body heat melted the snow away from him enough that he had just a little bit of oxygen there. Hold on there, Don. We just knew that we had to get Don out of there as quick as we could. Snow was extremely packed. You just couldn't hardly dig it at all. Hang in there. And we finally decided we had to get the door open in order to get more room to get him free. Two hours after Don had been buried by the avalanche, members of the Teton County Sheriff's Department arrived under the direction of Sheriff Roger Millward. The snow sets up like cement, and it's slowly compressing tighter and tighter on him. His ability to breathe and his ability to move is, is almost nil. You can see that the hypothermia is setting in. We weren't sure of what his injuries were. The volunteer fire department arrived, led by Rolf Belden. I joined him in the cab, tried to talk to him, keep him alert. He didn't know his name, he didn't know where he was, couldn't really talk to me in a way that you can understand. Volunteer firefighter Jim Tucker had never worked in avalanche rescue before. We were in the extrication about an hour. Somebody mentioned his name, Don. And I just, oh my God, <laughs> this is my neighbor. I seemed to just like shift gears. I just went faster. The whole thing kind of got to me a little bit because I knew we couldn't get him out. Got so tired, everybody was just getting tired where they couldn't shovel anymore. We knew we had to keep going. It had been four hours since Don was buried in the snow. We had to dig clear down almost to his ankles before we got him free. He seemed to be deteriorating fast on us. Once your body core temperature reaches, I believe it's about 80 degrees, uh, recoveries are a lot harder. Up the board. Okay, here we come with IV, guys. We finally got him out. I felt real relief finally, but I was really apprehensive about whether he was going to make it. 
When they finally got Don out, his body core temperature had dropped below 85 degrees. The rewarming process was begun immediately. Things were looking pretty grim at this stage. Don was taken to St. John's Hospital, where he was treated by Dr. Brent Blue. When a person is below 90 degrees Fahrenheit, he is in the classification of severe hypothermia, and that is a, a critical life-threatening situation. They are sort of in a state of suspended animation. Their body functions basically, they're slowed down to a snail's pace. They don't require much circulation or much uh, oxygenation of their blood. Let's get the warming blankets on and the warming coils. Probably the most single greatest danger is cardiac problems and having heart rhythms that are abnormal. Okay, you know where you are? Don was moved to the intensive care unit, where the slow process of rewarming his body continued. His wife, Colleen, was at his bedside. There he was, all wrapped up in blankets, and there was cloths around his head, and he looked so cold. And I was so worried, and I didn't know what to think. Don's wife and daughter Julie stayed with him through the night. I was looking at Dad on the bed, and... Uh, he looked kind of like he'd aged real fast. He looked pretty haggard. He was fully warmed up to a normal temperature within 24 hours, which really was a dramatic recovery. We were very surprised that uh, Don didn't have uh, additional injuries, given that he had been thrown in his truck about 65 feet uh, down the avalanche path. Three years have passed since the accident. I guess it just wasn't my time to go. It's the only thing I can say. There was a lot of people involved in it. But you just, there ain't words to describe how you feel. It's just something else. I was out in front of my house. Don came over and shook my hand and gave me a big hug and thanked me for everything I'd done for him. I felt proud and relieved. <laughs> I'd known Don for about eight years. He'd give you the shirt off his back. He didn't say much. He just shook my hand. One week after the accident, Don was back on the job plowing Teton Pass. I figured if I didn't go back when I did, well, maybe I'd never have the nerve to go back up there again. After going back, well, it bothered me the first couple of times passing under there, but I finally got over it, and it don't bother me anymore. Next, 